The Institute of Robotics is a joint research center that belongs to Universidad Politecnica of Catalonia and the National Council of Research of Spain. ILI is located in Barcelona in the south campus of the UPC. It, the aim of the uh, Institute of Robotics is to do research in robotics and automatic control. It has four research lines, kinematics and robot design, mobile robotics, perception and manipulation, and automatic control. And moreover, it has six laboratories associated with each one of the lines. Uh, the ED has a special accreditation. It's a unit of excellence. That it is an accreditation given by the Spanish government to the research unit of Spain. It's the only one in Spain in robotics and control. And we have a specific work in a strategic research program that is called Human Centered Robotics. I'm going to talk now of one of the topics that we have done in research in Robocom Plus Plus project, that is Human Robot Companion. In Robot Human Companion, there are different topics, but I am going to talk only about a company engaged in search and follow people. We do with robots and persons, and we do uh, we have done the uh, models, and also we have done experiments in simulation and real life experiments. Human robot companion combines human robot collaboration and artificial intelligence techniques. The robot has to do actions together with the people that has to accompany and it has to take in account the people that is around and when it's moving and navigating together. It has to interact with the people that is a company in order to, to be able to facilitate the company to take in account the circumstances that can happen during this task. Could be that uh, also has to take in account by the standards that interrupt or in the middle when the, the, this task is doing. It has to have perception in order to identify the environment, identify and track people, interpret situations, and also sometimes do cooperative perception. But also it has to communicate with the people through dialogue, the speech, text, or visual. Could be that it has to do a non-verbal dialogue by moving the body, or sometimes implicit communication. But also all this has to be controlled by the decision making. The decision making includes reasoning, planning, look for the intentionality of the people in order to do the, the appropriate plans, and also agree with the people that is a company uh, in order to do this task. But also it has to include learning and adaptation for all the circumstances. We have done the real life experiments in the Barcelona Robo Lab, that is a, a live uh, lab that is a North Campus in UPC. It has, we have doing, been doing this experiment there, but also in the South Campus, and has, we have also a part of the uh, experiment labs. Okay, you can see here uh, some of the uh, approaches that we have done in real life experiments. First, human robot companions, if one person, you can see that the robot in this case, when it's doing side by side, has to allow when it's a narrow place, it has to allow the person go or in front or behind the robot. In this case, you see that it's in front. It has also to take in account what happened with other people that is around the, when it's doing this operation. You can see here on the right that some people is crossing in the middle of the company and what the robot is doing. It's a, a stopping, but it's continuing doing the company uh, in order then to, uh, to follow this, uh, this experiment, to complete the experiment. Although many things can happen, as you can see here. And, and also, you can see on the right side, uh, a robot is accompanied two persons in V formation. V formation means the robot is behind. We can also do, have done also experiment with side by side and uh, robots all together. On the bottom part, <coughs> you can see an approaching. 
the, the, the robot is approaching a person in order to do a start a dialogue, as you can see here. It can approach more than one person, but at the same time, it has to take into account if there is something in the middle, it has to avoid or it has to modify the, the navigation. Okay, you can see also here uh, another experiment with uh, robots, two robots that are looking for a person that is hiding in an environment. This person has attacked, and, but the robot has first to identify uh, people and they identify the one that has attacked. Attack. In this, there is combined with two robots that are exploring a big area and then both are sharing information in order to to leave each one to know where is each other. And then afterward, they follow the person that they have to look for. Finally, you can see here engaged people. In this case, the robot has to first find a person, then start the interaction with this person, could be verbal or verbal, then try to do the engagement. And if it arrives to get do this engagement, then assist and start questions with the robot. The robot do the questions to the person, and there is a process of questioning and answering. Thank you for the, this. So with regards to high-speed event camera tracking, this work with is, uh, the main author is William Chamorro, and our uh, objective is to track the motion of a, of a camera, its position and orientation, when you have very fast motion, ultra fast motion. And the, the, the ultimate goal or the final goal of, of this application is to be able to have a, a very fast SLAM implementation with, with uh, event cameras. For this, we're only doing the localization part for now. And uh, this is just the first step towards having a full uh, parallel tracking and mapping implementation. So since we're only focused on localization, uh, we have the assumption that we're starting with a known scenario. And the scenario is parameterized as a set of three lines. Uh, to show you what the scenario would look like is, uh, you can see this. Uh, this is our handcrafted scenario. This is a scenario of about one square meter with 3D lines. Uh, this is the output that you will get from a Davis 240C camera. These cameras, uh, in contrast with uh, conventional cameras, they have very low resolution, but, um, but they are coming uh, more and more sensors on the way on, on the market, and you can have better cameras now. And so our, our algorithm to do the tracking of the camera is as follows. You have a narrow state camera filter. The nice thing about our proposal is that we have a rotations parameterized in the uh, special orthogonal uh, group. And uh, you will get uh, first the, uh, the input of the as asynchronous stream of events. At first, you have to do uh, distortion because you are using a camera that has a lens with a strong radial distortion, so you have to do undistortion. In order to be able to process all events really fast, you have to focus at each iteration on just a small window of, of events. So for that, we do a tessellation of the, of the image and of the image plane, and then we'll do the, the data association for all the events that are taking place in that little uh, square of the tessellation. So once we do that, we select which are the events that match the lines projected. Then we do the, the error state camera filter as usual in other computer vision problems. Once you have an, a measurement model, what you want to do is you want to do your camera filter. Improving the dynamics of the, of the motion model, you will get better performance. But in, on the contrary, since you have to do more computation, you, then you don't have a, you cannot process the entire burst of events if you increase the complexity of the model. So we could simplify the model and have, a, for instance, a constant position model in which you can process the, the 100 or 1 million events per second uh, if you just use the constant position model. And uh, that we can also use a constant velocity model or a constant acceleration model. Uh, then uh, we have two different uh, projection models. If the camera is moving in front of a static map, then you will have just this projection model. But instead, if the object is moving in front of the camera, and this is something that we had to implement because we wanted to, uh, uh, to push the system to the limit. We wanted to see whether, um, how fast can we move 
and still do the tracking. So now we'll give you some uh, some results of what we have been doing. We wanted to push, as I said, we wanted to push to the limit the problem. So we built a mechanism to move, to shake a pattern in front of the camera very fast. Uh, this is a four bar mechanism. So in this four bar mechanism, we can, uh, since we built it, the maximum velocity, the maximum duration that the parent takes, we can measure that. We can compute it precisely. So uh, as a function of the rotation speed of the crank. So in this case, for instance, you have a rotation of the crank at a speed of uh, uh, 800 revolutions per minute. That's about 30 her 13 hertz. And we can still track efficiently the the, the camera, the, the pattern with our, with our tracker. In this case, we are rotating at 900 revolutions per minute. And as you can see, we can still track. And this is the most that we could get. When you reach 950 revolutions per minute, that's about 15 hertz, then the tracker disengages. Uh, we obtained, uh, for this uh, rotation speed of the crank, we obtained uh, a target speed of 2.5 meters per second and a target acceleration of 25 G. And this is much faster than you would get, you would see in any other uh, uh, computer vision based tracker for events cameras that is published in the literature. So um, most of the trackers will get uh, at most uh, 4G or 5G, uh, even the IMU sensors that you will get inside the Davis camera is on an order of magnitude. Um, and being able to track accelerations at, at the order of 25 G is, is really fast. Industrial robots were or are still programmed by expert programmers, uh, while in assistive settings there are not uh, such um, expert programmers. Usually the robots have to be instructed by non-experts. Uh, then, uh, in industrial settings, the robots are caged, meaning that they, they are um, surrounded by sensors. And if at some moment someone enters the, this cage, uh, everything stops because it's very dangerous. Of course, if robots are to help dress people, for instance, uh, they must be intrinsically safe. It's not possible to stop them because they don't, well, don't do the, the task. Another important thing is that in industrial settings, usually objects are rigid work pieces in production lines and so on. And in assistive environments, there are plenty of deformable objects and in particular uh, clothing. What is the difference? The difference is that rigid objects, uh, once you have the pose, namely, the three degrees of freedom of position, for instance, like this, and three for orientation, the, the pose of the object is rigid, is fixed. Uh, you don't need to specify more things. While for deformable objects, imagine clothing, uh, it can take infinite um, dimensional ways, no? shapes. So um, manipulating clothing is much more difficult and need to be uh, solved. Uh, industrial robots uh, aim at precision and accuracy. Uh, while um, this is a good thing uh, or a favorable, a favorable thing of um, domestic environments in which um, precision is not a, a requirement. Clothes can be folded not very precisely and nothing happens. So, uh, but robots need to be tolerant to noisy perceptions and inaccurate actions. They should no longer um, behave through fixed sequences of instructions, always the same, repetitive, but should be capable of goal-directed execution. And of course, what I mentioned before, uh, they should collaborate a lot with people and attain uh, and perform tasks by uh, the interplay of robots and humans. So I will uh, show that some of these uh, characteristics for assistive robots uh, can be translated in features that AI needs to uh, address. 
the easy instruction by non-expert and intrinsically safe for people can be termed as usability, easy of use by non-experts. Uh, that um, robots are able to perceive um, and manipulate non-rigid objects and be tolerant to noisy perceptions and inaccurate actions calls for intelligent ways of dealing with uncertainty. And being capable of goal-directed execution and collaborating pe with people uh, calls for understanding. So it's not enough to give the right answer, but also uh, there has the programs and the robots should have some understanding of what's going on in order to, for different environments, different conditions, attain the same uh, result, the, the goal uh, they are programmed for. So this has been termed the three U terms of robotic research uh, in, in AI. The task of human motion prediction is uh, very important for different fields like uh, autonomous driving or uh, video analytics, but especially for the field of robotics, uh, robots uh, cannot move safely unless they are able to interact uh, with other people, anticipate their motion in the short term future, and understand how they are moving and interacting with other objects. So, so far, the state of the art has considered a sequence of observations of a single person. And at some point, they start decoding or predicting the future motion of this same person. In this paper, our point is that motion is not independent on the context. And we are actually trying to model the interaction between uh, the, the person and the other objects on the scene. So for instance, in this case, this person is placing a cap on the other side of the table. So he cannot continue working straight since uh, he has to lean over the table. And also the table is conditioning the future position of the class. So we model this using a, a graph uh, where each node represents a different person or object. And we start with a fully connected graph since we don't have any information on the, in, on the interactions. We let the network modify itself via an attention layer, the most important interactions, and at some time uh, they start, it starts decoding the rest of the sequence for all the objects. We show here some results of the interactions that the network provides. The green arrow represents the interaction between these two objects of the very simple action. And, uh, the table influences uh, the person with a very high percentage that is reduced when the person uh, gets closer to the table, since uh, now the person will not move depending on the table. At the, at the beginning, the table is attracting this person. Also, the table is not affected at all almost by the person pose, since it's still. We also try this with more complex interactions and uh, actions. For example, in this case, where there are two people um, and a table, an object on, on top of the table, and also a ladder. And we here, for simplicity, only show the top three interactions that are predicted by the network. In this case, uh, this ladder and this person are attracting this other person, which uh, now will grasp this object, and he, uh, he will hand the object to the other person. So uh, again, this ladder is attracting the object and the other person and conditioning uh, their future motion. When this person has the object, now the most probable action is that the object will at some point return to the other person. So the most uh, important interac interactions changed and now is the table that is attracting the other object. We also show some qualitative examples of the motion prediction. Like in this case, for the model, after seeing only this piece of, uh, of action, has to predict how the motion will continue. We show the ground truth in blue, uh, context agnostic model in green, and our model in red. So the context agnostic model in green is unable to predict that the person has to lean over the table since it doesn't know that there is a table. And our model is able to predict that the person will 
uh, lean over this table and place the object on the other side. For more details, please check our, check our paper um, or videos.